Welcome to the DLM Network Training Demand Response Video Series. The following videos are designed to supplement the DLM Network Training Demand Response PDF document you received with the video series. This video series will take you through the four steps that are required to implement demand response on any project. These four steps include site programming using LMCS, segment manager configuration and discovery, the installation and use of the Wattstopper custom palette that is included with this video series, and the site programming requirements using Niagara AX Workbench. Before we get started in LMCS, I just want to open up a uh, browser and take a look at the router configuration, just do a brief overview. Uh, the router configuration setup is covered in detail in a previously created PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we're going to go look at the router I've got for my test board here. It's at 192.168.5.68. Username is admin, password is admin. You can see I've given it a device name, it means something on the network, test board 8, uh, device instance, unique to this device, UDP port is BAC1, which is also 47809, and a BACnet IP network number of 2. Uh, these settings here will also match in the segment manager configuration. A unique IP address, uh, subnet gateway matches the IP address because we don't actually have a gateway on this network. If this were a customer network that provided us a IP and a subnet and a gateway, then we would enter that here. Otherwise, you can set it to the same as the IP address. It also has to have a unique MSTP network number. This one's set to 8608. And the rest of these settings can be left at default. You can save the changes if you make any, and this will also effectively reboot the NB router as well. All right, let's move into LMCS. Current alpha build is 4.4.209. Uh, should be a full release soon, uh, but I have included the version on the thumb drive with this video and the PDF document. So by default, LMCS, uh, when it's just installed or uh, upon first use, it's going to default with no BACnet IP connection or no connection at all in the bottom right corner. And there's just a new building, a brand new LMCS file that's created by default. What we want to do is configure LMCS to connect to the router that I have on my demo board. To do that, we're going to go to the support tab, go to preferences, and because I prefer to have all the settings available to me, I typically enable show technician pages just for uh, experts only, and UDP port is defaulted to 47.808. Now because we changed our router to 47.809 or UDP BAC1, we need to make sure LMCS matches that as well. So we're going to change it to 47.809 and hit OK. And before I connect, I'm just going to go ahead and change this to DR Training demo. Just give it a file name. And I'm going to select my connection. I'm connected to this USB fast Ethernet adapter. It is connected directly to the NB switch, which has my segment manager and the NB router connected to it and on the same IP structure. Alright, so now that I've connected, See the little green connection LED? 
and you also see that the Discover option is now highlighted. All right, so now that we've got our connection established, we can go ahead and discover the rooms. Notice that the router immediately shows under your available networks, MSTP, network number, IP address, device ID, and description. I'm going to go ahead and select Discover All Rooms. This will automate the process of discovering each room, pulling them into the file, so we don't have to select Discover on different windows. Out, return the firmware ID of the LMBC 300s that are on this test board. Alright, discovery process is finished. The second and third windows will drop out and you just hit close to close the first window out. And you can now see that we've got a discovered network 8608 with the three discovered rooms from my pen. Now that we have the rooms discovered, we can open up the device grid to edit the rooms, the bridge names, uh, the load shed parameters, things of that nature. So I'm going to right click on the parent object in the tree and open up the device grid. Go ahead and expand it. We're going to look at the network bridge first. Everything defaults to sort by area and by room. Any of these objects can, in the cells, can be removed, shifted around. Uh, if you want a description here, instead of that, you can move them around all you want to. Also, if you don't want to see the breaks for the room, the sorting, the default sort, you can drop that down. So now you just get a single line list of all the bridges that are in your file. We're going to edit this file and give these room numbers of a valid or these bridges a valid room number. I know that their location is on my demo board number eight so in their location parameter I'm going to go ahead and type in demo board eight. I'm going to control C select all and control C and click on the next cell hold my shift key and press down twice or if you have a large file with a lot of bridges in the list you can just hold the shift key down and hold the down arrow and it will scroll down the list and select all the cells 
and then just do control V for paste. That works for any common application per device on any on any device in the device grid. So in this description here, I've got a list of rooms that I actually have uh, been predefined. For instance, from the contractor that this serial number is this room. And I know that uh, serial number 2525 is actually room number 8100 know that 2606 is 8102 and 3079 is 8101 alright are there any other parameters that need to be changed in the device grid here for the network bridge you can do so here square footage um, different things like that uh, also it's worthwhile to note the sorting capabilities of the device grid uh, if you wanted to sort location for instance if this was a large file and you had uh, uh, first floor second floor third floor rooms uh, you can use the location field here the filter to either type in demo board 8 or first floor or second floor or you can use the auto filter which will give you the, the different options so if one of these were demo board 7 my auto filter would give me two different options now or all Same goes for any one of these columns. Everything can be sorted using the filter. So now that we've made the necessary changes for the bridges, I'm going to go ahead and send to the bridges. This is a relatively quick change. Hit close. You have a last tra transfer uh, timestamp so that you know that the device received the data and we've completed sending the bridges using the same process we're going to go to the controller tab and we're going to begin editing the room controller settings for the load shed control I'm going to go ahead and drag my room down here so it puts it in a nice list. Uh, best practice would be to go ahead and set the voltage parameters of all your controllers. Uh, in this case, I'm connected to a 120 volt circuit. So I'm going to set it to 120. I'm going to control C after selecting it. And hold the shift key and the down arrow to select the column. And hit control V to paste the value. Uh, again, just like in the last example you can do that all the way down down the row if if you've got a lot of room controllers in this file you can quickly make that change the next tab we want to look at is the uh, load so since I'm using 100 series controllers I've only got the capability of doing switch load so with 100 series and LMCP panels you can shed certain relays uh, their shed value would be set to zero so they would not be able to turn on during a shed event. Uh, for this example we're going to shed to a 50% lighting condition with these 102's so right now the shed level is set to 100 on all of these uh, so if I just wanted to change the setting for load B I could actually come to the filter they only show me load B on all room controllers and change the shed level to zero. You can do a control C and then select down with the shift key and hit control V and it will change those to zero. And come back here and remove the filter. So now you've got A at 100 and B at 0 on all three of these rooms uh, in 
a shared event. The last thing we're going to change is the operating mode. Since this is a shed event example, uh, we're going to change the off only condition to follow on and off on these rooms. Uh, the assumption here is that you're at 100% lighting and you want to go to 50 during a shed event. So if I drop load back down here and tell that I only want to see load B, I'm going to change it to follow on and off. And while the cell is selected, I'm going to control C, select the next one down, shift down a few times, and control V. Follow on and off, load B's, normal hours and after hours, or however the site needs to be configured. So we've made the necessary changes for this file. One other thing to note is just in the 200 series room controller, this shed level can be any value between 0 and 100%. It's going to use the 0 to 10 volt dimming circuit. Uh, most facilities are going to give you a, a shed value that they want to go to during a, a shed event. And that would be the value that you'd enter in to this column. The last step is to send the room controllers. This will take just a minute longer than the bridge only send. The room controllers take a little bit longer to send all their data. All right, now all the devices have sent. Close. Verify that the last transfer time is stamped into each one of these devices. And uh, from this point, we're done with the device grid. We're going to close it down. Also, refresh your tree to update the room names. And we're going to save our file. The next process in the demand response programming is to program and discover the segment manager. You can open your browser, enter in the IP address of the segment manager you're connected to. In my case, it's uh, 192.168.5.128. Login user is admin. Password is Wetstopper. You can also use Segman Wetstopper. Got a few quick things to change. Customization. Call the 
that's the training demo. And we want to configure the BACnet settings to match those of the router. So we go to BACnet settings. And you see that right now I have no BACnet ports enabled on this segment manager. I'm going to enable BACnet IP network number 2, which is assigned to LAN port 2. Its UDP port is already set to BAC1 by default, which is the same UDP port that we've got set in our router and the same one that we set in LMCS for programming. And I'm going to enable this. IP network is now enabled. And we've given the segment manager a valid station name. Now that we've got the segment manager configured, uh, the next step is to discover the network. Go to the settings tab, go to device discovery. I'm going to click on start stop a discovery. Discover. Select the router or routers. Uh, I typically like to do one router at a time, at most two depending on how heavily loaded each router is. Start. The discovery process is a three-step process. The first one is a network who is. The segment manager asks what devices are on the network. Relatively quick process. Second stage is the loading rooms and panels process. This is the segment manager jar file creating all the necessary objects, points, and uh, everything that are just discovered by default for each room. This usually takes a little bit longer than the first process and scales based on how many devices, how many bridges are actually on each segment. See, I only have three devices on my network, so it immediately jumps to 33% when it finished the first one. Next value will be 66 and then 100% when it finishes the last one. And now the devices have been loaded, it's now activating them, which is actually going through and enabling each room one by one in the BACnet network. All right, and once it's completed, get a report of the discovered devices. You can go back and look at the device tree now and see that we have a location discovered as demo board 8 because we have rooms that have a location parameter that say demo board 8 and we have rooms 8101, 8100 and 8102 in our device list alright the next step in the process is to install and open the custom palette that I've created for Niagara Workbench. Uh, this palette gives you uh, several of the standard palette options along with some custom applications including demand response or load shed uh, all in a single palette so you don't have to continually open palettes in Niagara AX. Uh, this folder, Custom Palettes, is installed on 
thumb drive that has this video and the training documentation and uh, the process for being able to use it in Niagara AX simply be to copy the folder and open your C drive or whatever drive your Niagara folder resides on navigate to the Niagara 3.7.106 folder and paste it directly in this folder you can see I've already got it installed um, you would just paste it directly under your Niagara 3.7.106 folder in order to open it in Niagara I'm going to close this and we're going to go into workbench is going to be our next step. To open the custom palette, uh, typically if you've been using Niagara Workbench much, you're going to have the last palette that you opened already in this list. Uh, if you've never opened the custom palette before, you can hit the open palette button. And it will not show up in your palette list because these that are in the list are associated to the modules. Since this is a custom palette, it doesn't have an associated module. It doesn't show up by default in this list. So you have to browse for it. If you go directly under SysHome, Custom Palettes folder, select the custom graphics.palette file and hit open. You now have a new palette that has just opened with several different options that you may recognize. There's the uh, Baja UI for PX page editing, the Kit PX also for PX editing, Kit Control, the Niagara driver for supervisor implementation, uh, alarms, history, schedule, the segment manager 2, and demand response. I'll spend a minute uh, discussing these real quick. So, segment manager 2 folder underneath the palette, the custom palette. If you expand it, I've got a folder in there called bridge points. These are a, this is a complete list of all the standard bridge points that would be discovered or that can be discovered on a segment manager. Um, these are the points that do not come in by default. So uh, the segman jar file does not automatically add these points into a bridge when it's discovered. They're available, but it doesn't add it automatically. Um, these are there for convenience. If you ever want to add, you know, force on or force off to a room uh, or load shed, which we're going to show a different path in just a minute, uh, you can actually just copy and paste these points directly into a point folder on a, on a network bridge. Uh, the BACnet instances are already set up. They're already pre-configured, uh, just like they would be if you discovered them in there. You just drop them in. The second one I'm going to look at, and the one we're actually going to be covering in the rest of this video, is the Demand Response folder. It has a Load Shed folder, which actually has custom logic. We'll look at here in just a minute. It also has the load shed control point, which was also in this. It's the same point, but it's in two different locations. A copy and pasteable point that you can drop into any room. And it also has the updated set room names to description V2. Uh, recently found that there's a small bug in the set room names to descriptions program object that's installed with the segment manager distribution file. Uh, it doesn't uh, add the rm underscore before the description so if you have any uh, rooms that have numbers it will not rename those because uh, in AX you cannot have a device begin with a number. Uh, so this object correct corrects that so if you have this custom palette or custom graphics palette then you'll have the updated module and we'll show you the steps to to add that to an existing station
All right, so the final process or step to the process of adding demand response to a network DLM system will be the workbench logic. In the previous step, we open the custom graphics palette and uh, now we're going to go through the steps of actually adding the logic and the linking process uh, to make demand response work. So we want to open a station connection to our segment manager. This is a segment 2, so it needs to be an SSL connection. Admin Watt Stopper as the username. Now that it's open, let's go ahead and expand the config folder. And we're going to take some objects that are in our custom palette and go ahead and paste them into our station. So let's do this first. Home directory is where the set name, set room names program object resides. We don't want to use this one. It's got a uh, small bug in it that doesn't allow it to rename rooms with that begin with numbers. So we're just going to right click on it and delete it out of the folder. You can now come down here to the demand response folder in your palette. And we're just going to click on this and hold and drag it into the home folder. And ask you what you want to call it. V2. It's fine. And now we have a control logic object dropped in. Uh, the next thing we want to go ahead and add from this, under your custom points folder, which is empty by default, I'm going to take this load shed folder and left click and hold and drag and drop on the custom points folder. Select OK. This will take a couple of seconds to drop that in. So now we have a load shed folder already created and already has the custom logic, which we'll be going over here shortly. Uh, obviously, you can see the objects that are in this folder. We'll look at the wire sheet to go over in detail what's in there. And the last thing we want to go ahead and copy into the station is the load shed control point. Uh, the easiest way to do this, uh, obviously on a large system, it'll be a little bit time consuming to do this. Uh, there is uh, a, a new segment manager version that's going to be released that will automatically discover this point. Uh, until that's released, this is the only method of dropping it in, uh, or the fastest method of dropping it in. Eventually, uh, just so you'll know, under the services, in the Segman BACnet service, if you right click on it and go to properties view, there are a couple of, there's one point specifically in this version that doesn't automatically discover, and that's the Boolean loads. So by default, the analog object for each load is discovered, but the Boolean object is not. Um, you can select that to true before you go into a discovery process and it will add those points in during the loading uh, device phase of the discovery process. Uh, the future segment manager release uh, should have similar options for the load shed point, the force on point, things to that nature where you can uh, install your segment manager, go into the service, and tell at what point you do want it to discover based on the sequence of operations at the project and then once you perform a discovery it will automatically add those points in for you. Uh, but for this training session we don't have that option so we have to do it the long way. So if you go to drivers, backnet network, you'll see the three rooms that were created 
Now, obviously, right now they're still labeled based off of their device ID. We are going to change that shortly, but first, let's take this load shed control point and just do a copy. You can see right now it's not listed in the points at all. Just right click on points and do a paste. It's going to ask you if that's what you want it to be called. Just hit OK. It's going to immediately drop the point in and it subscribed, polled as a writable object and the status is OK. Uh, this point is already pre-configured as stated previously for everything that we need for the load shed object. So you'll simply do that for each point folder. Paste. Okay. Paste. Okay. So now all three rooms now have the load shed control object. Now that we've got all the necessary objects pasted from our custom graphics palette, uh, the next step is simply to rename the rooms to their descriptions. Uh, very simple step as long as the LMCS programming that was pushed out uh, had room name descriptions that didn't have any special characters, things like that, that we discussed earlier in the video. Uh, this program object simply takes the description field and changes the device name from room underscore serial number to rm underscore description. So right clicking on the object, go into actions and rename rooms, we'll run the process. There it is. You'll also notice that they're uh, ordered in the same order that they were on the Segman GUI that we looked at earlier. Um, even though they're not sorted A to Z, uh, in order to change that here and in the Segment Manager GUI, you right click on BACnet Network and go to Reorder sort by name. It's going to change the order of the devices here and it's also going to change it here. Now, we've been automatically logged out so let's log back in. Now they're listed in order of room number. So now let's take a look at the load shed folder that we pasted earlier. Double click on it will open up its wire sheet. There are several objects in the wire sheet. Um, it's pre-configured for up to three stages of load shed control and they're predefined by common areas, open offices, and offices and conferences. Um, this can be edited in any fashion that you need. Um, as far as, you know, maybe it's a three-story building and they want to break it out into load shed, first floor, second floor, and third floor. Um, so obviously the names of these points can be changed uh, if you want to define them as something different. Um, there are also provided three different control inputs 
uh, for the logic. So this one controls to stage one, this one controls to stage two, and this one controls to stage three. Uh, the end switch object of each one of these points can be linked from anything, a, a group object, a schedule, a LMIO status, if we've got a, a room controller that, that's uh, in, a, in a room with an LMIO to follow a dry contact from an outside source, uh, you could link the output of that relay directly to the input of this switch object uh, to make the control function happen uh, automatically. There's also a direct override control here. So no matter what's happening on the input side, you can override the load shed condition uh, by overriding it disabled or going into the individual stages one, two, or three and defining an actual time period that you want it to be set to. Uh, so if we wanted to keep it disabled so the inputs could not drive it, you could select it to permanent and it's going to go into load shed disabled and no matter what happens on the switch inputs, uh, nothing is going to happen. Uh, this whole uh, wire sheet is actually designed to fit pretty well in a, a PX page, so you have a direct override control along with the status for each one of the uh, load shed zones, the stages, uh, along with uh, control methods, so you can control whether or not a room can be overridden locally while it's in load shed. So the default condition is load shed override forbidden, which means when we go into load shed, the user can't get up and hit the button and drive their lights back up to 100% if we're topping them out at 60%. Uh, the other control method is to allow, so you can change this. So by default, again, it's load shed forbidden. You can change it to load shed allowed. This is going to change the settings in all three stages. So if I were to go to set load stage to 1, you'll see that these two objects remain disabled. Load shed stage 1 is now saying load shed override allowed. If I came back over here and changed this to forbidden, it would transfer it to the point object once it's linked up. Obviously right now we have nothing linked up, so you can drive and test this all day long until you get it exactly the way you need it to before you start linking up the objects. Go to load shed, shed stage 2. And now you have this point and this point active and this one disabled. And then 3 will enable all three objects. Again, if this is being controlled, basically a manual software interface, doesn't matter what happens on these inputs. Uh, so if the customer doesn't have a set plan on how they want to drive demand response load shed, then their only method is going to be through here. So developing a PX page, give them a, a link from the Segman GUI uh, page to, to get to that. and. Uh, be able to turn it on and off as they so desire. If they are being driven by contact inputs, then you can just set this to auto. And this one will drive. So in this case, they could have up to three LMIO 101s to control three different stages. It may be that they only need one stage. They don't need three different stages. There's really no need to get rid of any of this logic in that case. You would just control everything from the first object and the controlling source would just be linked up to this stage control one. Uh, so essentially you would just be using stage one. The final step to implementing the load shed is going to be the linking process. I'm going to show you a shortcut. 
in accomplishing this. It only takes really a, a few minutes, depending on the, s the size and scope of of the building. Uh, in this case, obviously, we only have three rooms, and we're only going to use one stage method. So uh, the first step is to go to your load shed folder, and since we're going to just use this this one object, I'm going to right click on it, say link mark. I'm going to navigate to my first room. It's a point folder. Then it's load shed control point. I right click and say link from load shed underscore common areas or whatever you rename that object to be. We're going to link the output of the load shed control object, which is the source, to the target load shed control in 7. Uh, we try to just get above the priority 8. Since we can't control it priority 8, we try to go higher than, than 8. So 7 is the, the next option. So uh, just link it to the N7. Click OK. If we slide this over a little bit, we'll see that the object has a new tag reference. With my mouse over it in the bottom left corner, you can see that it's saying the load shed slash load shed common areas dot out is linked to drivers backnet network room 8100 points load shed control another way to view this is if you right click on the object go to views link sheet it's going to show every link that this object has so if we link the output of that object to the other two rooms you would see three link references in this list obviously with only three rooms we could repeat that process fairly quickly but to show you a shortcut when you're dealing with you know 30 rooms or 300 rooms uh, there is a faster method so what we want to do is go to the link sheet of the point that you just linked it to the one room that you choose to link the object to go to views go to its link sheet so now we see that it's got a reference from to the N7 from the output of this common area object. Double click on the link. It's going to give you a, an editor view of, of that object. We don't actually want to change anything here. We just want to record what's in this list. So the object type is link and it's actually called link with a capital L. So typically what I like to do is create a text file on my desktop that I can make these kind of notes in. So it's called link the source ord equals for the sake of making sure you get it correct, we're going to select it and control C and control V. Now the other ones aren't quite as important. That source ord is the most important part. Um, of course the next two fields are important but they're a lot easier to remember. Source slot name equals out, lowercase. It is case sensitive. And target slot name equals N7. Again, case sensitive, lowercase in. And the enabled equals true. Now, so that we've recorded these settings. I'm just going to minimize this for a second and just cancel out of that object. One thing to note, if you look at the slot sheet of this object, you'll see that the property link that we just opened and edited is shown as a slot. So it's a property slot called link with a capital L and it is a Baja link object. It's just important to note, note that for the uh, next step. So let's minimize that. We're going to use something that's called the program service. 
program service allows you to search and add or edit um, mass objects in Niagara AX so you don't have to do a one-to-one -one object for everything. So we're going to search and since I know that we're looking for the load shed control object it is a enumerated point. I'm going to tell it to search, span config, drivers, and go to the BACnet network. And the type I want it to find, because it is an enumerated object, a little orangish pink colored control object, I know it's an enumerated point, but I want it to find certain conditions. So I only want you to display enumerated points that have a display name with the N capitalized, like load shed control. So if I were to do this, it would go out and search and display every object in my BACnet network that's called load shed control. A second tier of this would be if you needed to specify a floor, for instance, you only wanted, you know, if you had a three floor load shed stage and you only wanted to find rooms that were on the first floor to link this object to, you could add another field, make sure that the match is set to all. And instead of saying display name, because I know that load shed control resides in the point folder, which is directly under the bridge itself, we're going to go up the ladder. So parent, which would be the point folder, dot parent, which is the room number of the bridge, the actual bridge object, dot display name, again with a capital M like rm underscore 8 star, which is a wild card. So if this were the 8th floor, for instance, it would only show us the load shed control objects for the 8th floor because theoretically the room number should begin with an 8 and then their actual room number. Um, you can see the value of having descriptions that actually mean something. Um, you can't actually add f other fields to the end of the description like restroom or RR, um, CORR for corridors, things like that. So you could actually search with this wildcard for anything that equaled CORR if maybe demand response was only supposed to go to corridors and common areas. Um, you could add those extensions to the descriptions before you rename the rooms and you would be able to search all of this uh, really easy and really fast. So we're going to hit OK. It's going to go out and think about it and pull them back. Depending on how many objects it finds is going to be how long it takes for that to pull in. If it closes real fast and doesn't show you any points and you don't get the hourglass, uh, then it there's something wrong with the query and you need to check it and edit it. So in this case we've got three different rooms. And I know I already linked to this one so I could remove it by right clicking and saying clear selected items but there's also another way. You don't have to select anything in this view. Anything that's in this view is going to be changed if you use any of these buttons down here. Uh, it's, it's a mass change. So what we want to do is add a slot because we want to add a link to these objects. Let's add slot. This is where the note comes in handy. So we know the name is link with a capital L. And because we looked at the slot to find out that it is a Baja component, but it's called a Baja link. So you can drop down, go find the L's, and there it is right here, Baja link. Now it brings up a very familiar object. Source ord, sort slot, sort slot name, target slot name, and the enabled value. 
So we're going to control C, change this null to that, and this is going to be out to N7. Just double check, out and N7, and the enabled value defaults to true. We're going to hit OK. And this option here, before we hit OK, set if it exists. So since we already set the first one, you can actually uncheck that object. It won't hurt it to set it again if it's already there, but there's no need for it. And this is a good way to check your work, too. And I'll show you after the work. we hit OK. All right, so there it is. I just mass added the same link output from that control object to every load shed control point that was in that view. And you can see that it did 8101 and 8102, but it left 8100 alone because the link already existed. Because we didn't have that checkbox check to add if it exists, or set if it exists. So click OK. You can clear these out. And now if we go back to our load shed control object, and look at its link sheet. Now it shows three links instead of one. So this tool can be used to again implement this link on three objects, 30 objects, 300 objects, however many rooms you have on that segment manager. This can really speed up that process. And now that we've actually got the link completed, we can actually control these rooms into load shed. So if I wanted to override this to stage one, see the output is load shed override forbidden at 10. We come back over here and look at the points. Load shed control is overridden at 7 because we have the output of that control object linked to the priority 7 array of this object. And if we go back, just watch it from here. Set it back to auto. Now it goes back to load shed disabled. That concludes the load shed demand response training for Niagara AX and DLM. I hope this helps uh, aid your startups in the future.